So looking at inflation, we'll touch on South Africa, but this really more than anything is a US issue, uh, and that's going to be our focus for this evening. And, and the first point I want to touch on is that the inflation we're seeing right now is not the 1970s. It absolutely is not the 1970s for a, a, a couple of very, very key reasons, which I'll go into. First was Bretton Woods. This was a post-World War II uh, conference, uh, 44 countries. And the plan behind Bretton Woods to really was set a gold standard uh, and have all currencies pegged to the US dollar. And what that meant is that economies couldn't compete in, in, against each other in terms of currency weakness, uh, which is attractive for certain economies. So it, it was trying to sort of level that playing field for the post-war economies. And we can debate whether it worked or not. Point being is that uh, in August 1971, Richard Nixon terminated the, 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 the effectively the Bretton Woods. He uh, terminated the convertibility of dollar to gold at that $35 um, an ounce, and that basically killed it. Bretton Woods was now over and uh, the dollar was now, as we call it, a fiat currency. So that in of itself had implications. And the immediate implication was the oil price. Saudi Arabia had been you know, quite happy selling their oil and, and others, but predominantly Saudi Arabia. OPEC was in existence by now. And what you saw was that, yeah, it was they were happy with it. They were burging along. All was good. But then when the, 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 the Bretton Woods abandonment happened, what we saw was a significant weakening of their currency. Uh, and suddenly they weren't getting the, the, the revenue that they needed. So they needed a higher oil price. And they manufactured a higher oil price largely by supply. Pull back on supply. That pushes price up. Net effect, West Texas Intermediate up tenfold in eight years. Uh, and, and that is just, you know, from, from beginning of from 1973 uh, to the peak in 1980. That that is just, you know, for 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 much of the world, absolutely disastrous. It, because, yeah, you know, obviously, oil is 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 in everything. And I'm not talking the plastic side. I'm talking the transport side. Mm -hmm. So it had a massive impact on the oil price, and that was hugely inflationary equally so recessionary, but it just meant stuff cost more because stuff was moving from A to B. Yeah, there was a move in the gold price. Uh, gold kind of liked it as well. Uh, gold was also up around 8x at the same time, uh, but uh, we know the gold story going on from there. The big story was gold. Sorry, it was oil. But there were other drivers happening at the same point, which had sort of started to really, really spur inflation. One of the key ones was a significant increase in wealth in American households during the 50s and 60s. In essence, the average household in America, the medium household, the wealth went up 40% during the 50s and the 60s, which meant coming into the 70s, American households were immensely rich compared to their, their, you know, their, 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 their previous generations. This is you know, a, a side story, but since then, pretty much it's gone sideways. But what had happened was we had seen uh, kids coming through uh, college and the like, and they were markedly richer than what their parents had been. And they were spending, and they were spending in an environment which already had inflation. The problem was, is that inflation is moderately easy to fix, right? You ramp rates. And, but uh, the, the politicians of the time just, you know, Nixon was distracted. Uh, Ford was too scared to. Carter was uh, too scared to. And then Flocker came along in the 80s and just absolutely ramped American rates. We'll see that in a moment. And that ultimately broke inflation. The key point was, is that he was very, very aggressive with his interest rate increases. And that's an important point. But we had the, the, the double whammy of a, an oil price that goes up 10x uh, during a decade. Uh, families coming into the 70s markedly richer than they had been in the preceding two decades. And this meant a lot of money chasing goods. And that's the core. What is inflation? It's when you know, money is chasing goods and there's more money than goods. And printing and stuff can have implications to that, but we'll come to data as well on that. Inflation essence, more than anything, it's around expectations. So yes, it's around that spending pattern that we saw in the early 70s, where on one side, richer families, on the other side, rising costs because of the oil price. But also, it was around the expectation. If you think something is going to become more expensive in a year, you buy it now. 
not food, of course. I mean, you can't store food for the period, but certainly water appliances, motor cars, housing, all of those sort of big ticket items. If you think prices are going up and it's going to be 5, 10, 15, 20% more expensive in a year's time, what do you do? You buy it now. And that pulls demand forward and therefore pushes prices even further, which means that your neighbor does the same. The inverse, we've seen it in Japan for the last two decades, deflation. If you think something is cheaper in a year's time, you wait. You don't buy it now, you wait a year. And of course, that completely removes demand from the scenario. So we had prices rising, we had wealth had increased, and then we had the inflation, which started to come in quite markedly, and that then brings that expectation. And expectations rise, people buy early, incomes rise, people buy more, cost rises, inflation rises, and it just becomes a spiral. And it is, I was going to say it's difficult to break. It's not. Block a broker in, in, in a matter of years, it's painful. That perhaps is the issue. And the pain has the risk of a, a, uh, a recession at the same price. But it is, to a large degree, it's around that expectation. And I'm going to talk about that a whole bunch. But it goes to the point. If inflation's running in, let's say, 10%, and you go to your boss and you want an increase, well, you want 10%. Uh, but if you've heard that inflation is actually running hot and it's going to be 13 or 14% next year, you don't want 10, you want 12 or 13. It's why our governor talks around 4.5%. He's creating that expectation. He doesn't refer to the band, 3 to 6. He talks straight about 4.5. He wants to, 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 to pin that expectation at a lower number. And it becomes hugely important, um, as, 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 particularly as inflation starts to go crazy one way or the other, either upwards or downwards. So let's look at, at, at some of the, the, the data. Uh, we particularly uh, pulled this presentation towards the end of November so that we would have the most current data. Uh, and there is US inflation, 6.2% uh, for October, which pegs it at the highest since 1991. A uh, couple of points about 1991. We had, I was going to say we had our last, we had one of the few one-term uh, US presidents in 91, the other being Trump, and then of course Carter uh, in, in, in 1980 lost to, to uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. But inflation is at pretty much record levels, certainly for a generation or more. Remember the target for US inflation is 2%. Now that target only came in in 2000, we saw some sparks around the, 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 the financial crisis, uh, some craziness there, but pretty much inflation has been largely tame for much of, of, of the last decade. And, and more or less, we can say for the last 25 years, except for some sparks here uh, with the global financial crisis. So US inflation is absolutely running hot. Make no mistake about that. The plan is it was going to be transitory. And that made perfect sense. Let's go to April. What did we have in April 2020? Well, we had negative oil prices. Yeah, stuff like that. We, we, we couldn't go shopping. We could online shop, but we certainly weren't out and about. Uh, people were losing jobs. People were saving money. The savings rate went up quite markedly in the US last year. So the transitory story with base effect and the like made sense. But now it doesn't make sense. Six months in, of plus 4% inflation, seven months of plus 2% in inflation, 6.2 for October. This is no longer looking transitory by any stretch of imagination. Now, he has a cunning thought, which uh, Adrian Seville mentioned to me. The use of the word transitory was about expectation, was it not? I mean, what were they effectively doing? When I say they, I mean the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell and his colleagues, they were trying to create the expectation. They were saying, look, we know inflation's 5% in May, but, but don't ask for 5% uh, wage increases because it's transitory. It's coming down. They tried to set the expectation. They failed. And I know that some of it was, for example, used cars. We're running at 30% year-on-year inflation. There were, you know, logistics. We'll come to all of that. The point being is, is that the transitory word has now disappeared. This inflation is not transitory. So what drives inflation? What are the, the, the current drivers that we're seeing on the ground around inflation? The first is oil. I mean, oil is, you know, again, it comes to the point. I mean, we're, as a planet, trying to get off oil, right? We're trying to get away from, from, from combustion engines and the like, although plastic is the next point in, in, in that. But whatever the case, you know, we just had COP26, and we can park that aside for a totally different debate. But what we have 
is oil. This is uh, Brent, West Texas, a couple of dollars lower, sitting around 82. That is high. If we look at the, the trend pretty much over the last eight years, that average has been closer to 55, 50, bit of time in the 60s. We had higher at that point there, quite markedly higher at around the 100. And of course, in 2008, we had 150 oil. Um, but we've fairly had a much lower oil price. This comes into every goods that are moved, oil is part of the equation. It's petrol, it's gas if you live in the US. Um, so certainly this is driving to it. The, the OPEC plus nations, what are they saying about oil? Well, they're looking at the data. Truthfully, they're not unhappy with oil at, at this point. What we then get is oil coming through into everything, but there's more than just oil here. Cost of living adjustments. So this is social security cost of living adjustments since 1975. It doesn't include the adjustment that will kick in next year. That adjustment is coming in at 5.9%, which makes it effectively uh, the highest since 2010. Uh, and preceding that, we are back into the early 80s. And this is what I mean by getting baked into the system. A 5.9% increase is, a, probably fair because of the, the underlying inflation in the economy, but B, it, you know, depending on, the, on people's spending, and particularly in old age, medical is your bigger issue and 5.9 probably doesn't cover it, but what you're seeing is it's pushing money into the economy, money that gets spent. Now, if prices are up 5.9 and you got 5.9, well, then neither here nor there. But if, if your shopping basket is 4% and you got a 5.9, and then you're ahead of the curve and you're going to spend a little bit more and push that in. But this does create, you've got a 5.9. You, you, you know, if you're looking to buy something in a year, you're worried about inflation, you're going to buy it earlier. Wage increases. There's a couple of drivers here. The one is the great resignation. People are just not coming back to work in the US. They're quitting. Uh, and the solution there, quite simply, is higher wages more than just higher wages, also just more flexible working conditions. There's a, a hotel chain who will uh, help you get your 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 uh, 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 hotel qualifications. They'll give you a set of knives, which seems a weird one. But there's another underlying, perhaps bigger issue here, and that's immigra immigration uh, into the migration into the U.S. The U.S. has always had been a, a migration economy. They've always taken people in, and that's helped fund their growth. You need more people to be growing. Yes, you get efficiencies and, and, and productivity increases, but you need more people to be coming in because those are the people who are going to help it grow and make the economy bigger. Uh, what we've seen is that the actual has gone significantly down. And the, the estimate here, and this is from JP Morgan, says there's a shortfall of 2 million workers that we have seen. Um, this is up to, to last year. This is not including this year. But quite frankly, uh, Biden is not in any stretch significantly changing the Trump responses. He has on the margins, but not to the degree. You lose 2.1 million people in a, in, a, in, a, in a workforce, and I appreciate America is a giant workforce, 300 million population, workforce of, 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 of about 160 million. It, 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 it creates tightness in, in, in the space. And what I mean by that is the great resignation, people are unable to get short order cooks and waiters and all of that sort of thing. If you had an extra 2 million, 2.1 million people in the population and not they wouldn't all be of working age, that would take some of the pressure off it, which means wages are rising. Uh, they've had the whole big debate around minimum wages in the US. And quite frankly, uh, what we're seeing is that many companies are having to pay well ahead of minimum wage just to attract staff. This again, is 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 baking itself in now this isn't a result of inflation but this leads to inflation this shortfall the fact that people during the lockdown a couple of things happened they were able to boost their savings because they were getting paid 600 dollars a week as, as as unemployment for the during the pandemic and the hard lockdown um and they weren't going anywhere so saving rates in the u.s went up significantly people also i think took a long hard look at their lifestyles and said you know what, hang on a second. Uh, I don't like these two jobs, which are both, you know, terrible jobs. Uh, I, I I want better quality and and and, and better job and uh, you know working conditions, better pay, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is underlying structural, but what the, the wages is doing is it's pushing more money into the economy. So someone who was earning 
I don't know, a thousand dollars a month, let's say, pre-pandemic, is now earning fifteen hundred dollars a month. Yes, their life is costing them more because of inflation, but they've also got more money just disposable, which they are now spending. So this is a, a, a biggie which is significantly underpinning it. And no reason why why this trend won't continue, losing around about a shortfall of around about half a million uh, per year on, on current trend. Uh, and, and that, you know, if, if the trend worsens, that will change significantly. We also have an everything rally. So this is a one-year chart, and I just picked a bunch of random uh, uh, commodities. Heat and oil, coal, steel, aluminium, copper, wheat, corn, natural gas, gasoline, live cattle, and sugar. And the only one that isn't up massively, or the least up, is up 4.2%, and I was going to take that one off, but I thought let's leave it there. We've got increases ranging from 24 to 140 percent. 140 is cold. It's come back massively. It was over 300 percent earlier in the year. But you see those sort of now. You know, copper is an input into into housing. Uh, aluminum, steel, the same. Uh, heating or coal is is energy. Wheat and corn is food. Natural gas, gasoline. Uh, live cattle is food. This is all. You know your base commodities. What we haven't got here is gold and platinum and and the precious metals because you, you don't eat those. They're not. You don't use them to heat your house. You don't use them in your breakfast cereal or your your dinner, as, as the case may be. Now, will these prices alleviate? Sure, probably in time. They commodity commodities, so they're cyclical, right? If prices remain elevated, more supply will come on. But they're also hampered by that sudden demand which arrived, which caught everyone by surprise, which happened sort of fourth quarter of last year, and logistics, supply chains. It's getting stuff from A to B that is hurting. An equity you know, rally, when I say there's an everything rally, uh, equities. You know, Long-term averages for pretty much all of these is probably single digits. And yet here we are, we have got uh, 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 Japan at 9.2, we've got Hong Kong at negative nine and a half, but uh, UK 12, Australia 13, Germany 17, um, S&P 24, Kakarot. France, this is year to date. France, actually the best, actually the one that's coming out most. S&P, interestingly, beating the NASDAQ over the period. But these are all markets way ahead of what you would normally expect. And this is inflation in markets. If we look at post the great financial crisis, 2008, 2009, all the money printing, everyone said it's going to lead to inflation. It didn't. I mean, here we are finally 12 plus years later, we see the inflation. But it did lead to inflation. It led to inflation in equities, stock markets. The decade of, 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 of the, the teens was you know, one of the best decades to be invested uh, in, 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 in US equities. It created an equity, a stock market boom. What we saw last year with the, with, with the disbursements is instead of going to Wall Street, they went to Main Street. They went into people's pockets. Hence, we see this. And of course, people then also went and, and invested. We, we've seen the meme stocks, the Wall Street bets and the like. So we're having an everything rally. You know, yes, and I appreciate that there are stocks that are down, but mostly if we look at indices, if we look at commodities and the like, everything has been rallying. This also makes people feel richer. Your, your stock portfolio is up you know, 20, 25 percent over the course of the year, you feel richer. So you take a little more money out of the credit card. Maybe you sell some shares. You take a holiday or a dinner or or something like that. It comes back to expectation. It comes back to how people feel and how they react. Monthly, monthly housing starts all the way back to the 70s. What you see is in the lead up to the great <clears throat> to the financial crisis, massive boom in housing. We saw it in the 70s as well. In the 70s driven predominantly by, as I've said earlier, those families who were richer, who'd done much better after the 50s and 60s. But what we what we saw after the after the housing crisis of 2008 is that people were scared to lend into the sector. The sector got decimated in 08 or 09, and people just left the industry. Um, you know, your builders went and found another job or retired, uh, building companies shut down, et cetera. So what have we got? We have had significantly less new housing in the U.S. to the point where the U.S. has a housing shortage, a fairly chronic housing shortage. So what's happened there? Housing prices have been booming. Again, you've now got American families who've been receiving 
money from the state, their equity portfolio is looking great, their house price has boomed, so maybe they're taking equity out of their house as well, and they're spending the money. And that's what I mean by, if inflation was transitory, by now it would be out of the system. It's not transitory, and we know this because we can see it, because American families are feeling richer, and frankly are richer, both in dollars and cents, but also in their balance sheet, in their equity, in their home, in their investment portfolio. And they're out there and they are spending. They are spending stuff. And we, we're seeing it come through in those inflation numbers. I mentioned logistics. One of the huge accomplishments perhaps of this century has been the just-in-time supply chain. I mean, Tim Cook at Apple was an absolute master of it. I mean, if you think about Apple, who sold 70 million, uh, uh, 80 million iPhones in a quarter, that's a million, almost a million iPhones a day. To, to have that supply chain where the phones are made in Foxconn in China uh, with parts from 11 or 12 different countries depending on which phone it is and they're then sold around the world predominantly the us and europe but iphones are sold largely around the world so it absolutely worked in the sense of the just in, in, in time supply chain it is a it is a marvel and then COVID shut it down and it hasn't yet unlocked i was in durban on the weekend and you know Whenever I go to Durban, I count the ships waiting outside the harbor. And at times, they're 10 or 12. This time, there were 30. Now, there are challenges with Durban port, but there's also challenges with supply chain. This is Long Beach in California. Um, this port has got delays at points of 30 days. Typically, your wait time to dock used to be, if things were rough, your wait time was yeah a day and a half, maybe two days. Now, there are wait times of 30 days. And it's everything. They, they don't have enough trackers. We saw the story earlier this year in the UK where there just weren't enough truck drivers. Why? Well, because truck driving is a horror job. It's not a very well-paid job. In the lockdown of last year, a lot of truckers just either quit the business, the industry, retired, went and did something else. Um, now, suddenly, there's this vast amount of, of goods coming through, and there's not enough truck drivers. There's not enough containers. Containers are being stuck in the wrong parts of, of, of the world. It's just, you know, and, and then a port suddenly gets shut down in China because of some COVID cases, and a port gets shut down for two weeks, and, and nothing leaves, and then suddenly two weeks of ships arrive on one day. The, the, the supply chain is proving an absolute nightmare. Pretty much folks have been saying, give it six months, it will shake itself out. But they've been saying that now for a year, and it is not shaking itself out. If you speak to folks, if you listen to uh, the likes of the Toyotas uh, and, and, and the large manufacturers, and even locally in the JSC when I speak to CEOs, they're now all saying, look, we're kind of hoping late 2022, but realistically, it might be 2023, which means that there's just less of the goods that you want to buy which again makes a shortage, which means more people chasing less goods, more money chasing less goods, and therefore prices go up. Now, Apple's not gonna ramp up their iPhone to take advantage of this. They probably could, but they won't. They're looking at the longer term picture, but certainly there are folks who absolutely are taking advantage of it. And this logistics uh, uh, bottleneck, which is not going away is adding to the price. Now, you can go up the coast and go to a different port. You can go through Panama Canal and come in via the East Coast, but that all costs money, and there's your problem. And then, of course, I thought this was quite fun. This is a story I picked up just two days ago. Um, Dollar Tree, in the US, there's all these dollar stores. There's, there's a couple of, there's Dollar Store, there's Dollar Tree, there, there's uh, the Dollar Shop, et cetera, and they largely sell stuff for a dollar. Yes, they have more expensive stuff, but uh, they Dollar Tree said, yeah, look, this dollar idea no longer works, we're going to a dollar twenty-five, uh, and 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 uh, in truth, that's a small point, but it's telling in the sense that we, look what we're getting now. Suddenly, we're 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 seeing this inflation start to become baked in. Does Dollar Tree go back and say, ah, oh, we're abandoning the dollar twenty-five, we're going back to a dollar? Nah, probably not, right? They're at a dollar twenty-five. It is becoming baked in. So to the question up front. Is inflation becoming structural? Yes, it is becoming baked into the system. It absolutely is. To my mind, there's no doubt about that. Um, money supply, you know, uh, uh, 
what, 75% of all dollar bills have been printed in the last uh, year and a half during the pandemic. The question is, where does this money go? If it just goes to buy bonds uh, for the, the Federal Reserve in their, in their uh, uh, quantitative easing process, that doesn't bother me. Certainly, a lot of it did go into the hands of individuals. Um, is this inflationary? Certainly, the money has been rising. We saw a, a doubling between the crisis and now, uh, with the beginning of so the I, mean, I, I got to identify which crisis I'm talking about. Uh, the first, the financial crisis in 2008 and the pandemic, the 11 years between that, doubling of the of the of the money supply in the U.S., but it didn't have the impact that it, that, that that people were expecting in terms of being inflationary. And as I said, it went to Main Street, uh, sorry Wall Street rather than Main Street. Some of this money has gone into uh, Main Street, and people are spending. So how do you stop inflation, what do we do to make this sort of go away in a sense? You increase, you increase rates, interest rates. And, and why does that work? So interest rates work because everyone's got debt and you increase rates and it does two things. It sucks money out of the economy because I've got to pay more on my debt. Okay, so I've simply got less disposable income every month and therefore instead of having too much money chasing too few goods, I get the inverse not enough money chasing too many goods, the manufacturers lose pricing power. Um, the other reason why high in, 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 uh, interest rates work is people start to invest in that space as well. So, you know, they, they, they buy high yielding bonds and they put money in the bank account, etc. They're not out there buying GameStop or, you know, lumber or orange juice, whatever the case may be. And so high interest rates effectively solve the problem. The trick is, is that little, you know, taking the rate from a 0.25 to half to three quarters to one doesn't massively stop the trick. Look here, what Flocker did. So they tried it in the 70s under Carter. They panicked, they pulled back, and then they did it proper. They did proper interest, yeah, 20% interest rates in, in the US. Pulled the break off, saw inflation come back, went back to, to 18%, pretty much been downhill from there but this is not the 70s as, as i said this is not the 70s so we can be more uh, uh uh we don't need to be as aggressive but if you've got some, some debt and there's a quarter percent increase i appreciate it increases your your interest component let's say because the person in the street is not paying uh, uh 0.25 let's say you've got a a mortgage in the us and you're paying three percent on a 30-year mortgage and it goes up to three and a quarter um yeah that's not insignificant but it you know it's it's i mean what is it it's 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 it's, it's an eight percent increase on the interest component right not on the the principal just on the interest component so it hurts a little but i think you need perhaps more pain but rate increases is how we do it is there a perfect relationship between them no it is a completely blunt instrument and that's the the problem with inflation i was been listening to some podcasts from from odd lots uh, tracy alloway alloway at bloomberg and uh, joe weisenthal both from bloomberg bloomberg podcast is odd lots great podcast um and they've been talking to folks around inflation and and, and the like and and the general acceptance from folks who've worked for the fed and 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 etc cetera, etc cetera, is that you know what we kind of think we know what we're doing but the relationship is not necessarily as binary as we as we hope and we're also not a hundred percent sure really how inflation works a lot of it is is we kind of think but uh not a hundred percent and that's because economics is, is not a science and i know the economists hate it when i say that it, it's not a hard science it's a it's a social science um which means there's a lot of space left for interpretation so how much? Well, you need lots, right? If you really want to stop that inflation in its tracks, you need lots. The problem is, is that a lot of it is you know, staff shortages. You know, high rates doesn't solve the staff shortages. Well, it does to a degree, right? High rates, people eat out less, so you need less uh, staff with your local burger joint or steakhouse, whatever the case may be. Uh, but then your risk is recession. So you've got that, 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 that recessionary risk where you push it too high and you actually just start to slow down the economy and you start to rise unemployment. And those are two things which absolutely the Federal Reserve does not want to do. So when do we need them? We need them soon, sooner rather than later. Remember, middle of the year, uh, interest rate increases in the US were supposed to be 2024. 
uh, and then suddenly they became 2023, 20, uh, second half of, of, of next year. And I even think that boat has sailed. Um, these are the, the FOMAC uh, Federal Open uh, Monetary Committee meetings for 2022. Um, I think we'll see our first increase, certainly in the June or July, maybe the May dot, unless we get really, really good uh, uh, inflation coming markedly down. And I don't see that happening. A couple of things. To, to not completely terrify the market, the Fed needs to start telegraphing this. If you witness the tapering, um, they were doing, what, 130-odd billion a month in terms of, of, of asset purchases. And they dropped that uh, by 15 billion. They'll drop it by another 15 billion in December. And beyond that, they haven't given us a glide path. But that pr basically takes the asset repurchases to zero at around about June or July. They could accelerate that because it would be really weird if, on the one hand, you're buying uh, bonds, which is essentially dampening interest rates on the bonds, right? Because you're buying the bonds, uh, so, so prices are up and yields are down, and that's in your 2, 5, 10, 20, 30-year U.S. bonds. So you're dampening interest rates on the bond side with your asset purchases, and you're raising rates on the other side. The two don't sit together. And I know James Bollard, who is a non-voting member of the FOMC, who will be a voting member in the new year, was saying, actually, we can do both. I, 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 that, that's double speak, right? You've got two contradictory things you're doing. It makes no sense. But what we might then see is some acceleration in the, the tapering. And, and more than anything, that's what I'm looking for. Do we start to see the tapering, in other words, the reduction in that asset purchase process? Do we see that number bigger than 15 billion? Does it suddenly start to get bigger? Do we also perhaps have uh, the Fed starting to say, hey, hey, we're looking at this. We're not worried, but we're going to raise some rates because we're at you know, abnormal low levels. In other words, telegraphing it to the market. The tapering, I think, was perfectly telegraphed in that there's no stress. There's no panic. Uh, back in what, 2013, when the Fed started tapering, the market absolutely panicked. Earlier this year, when there was talk around tapering, markets panicked. If you, if, you, if you telegraph it, you create that expectation, I think we can get away with it and say, nah, this will all be, you know, take it in our stride without causing absolute panic and, and sell-offs. So I'm expecting, I mean, maybe May. I think that's early. I think June, if not June, I think definitely we get an increase in, in, in July. And, and my sense is watch the language from the January and March uh, uh, meetings the press conference afterwards with Jerome Powell, the minutes that are released about a week or 10 days later, watch that language to get a strong sense of when it is coming. Let's quickly touch on SA inflation. SA inflation is benign. I mean, it's about the kindest thing. I know we got a rate increase from our MPC. Truthfully, uh, what I think our MPC was doing more than anything uh, was just trying to get ahead of the curve, and they don't really want a, a uh, they, they, they repo rate that low structurally. I think they want a little bit higher. And also the new, the, 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 so not the new, the current uh, governor has said that he actually wants to move our inflation target from three to six uh, down to two percent to four uh, percent and, and scale that down. And that was always the plan. Inflation targeting as a concept came in around the early 2000s with the EU, the US and ourselves all bringing in inflation targeting. And, and, and it, when we brought it in in February 2000, the plan was very much that what we would do, uh, Trevor Manuel was uh, uh, finance minister, uh, uh, Tabo Mbeki was uh, president, and uh, Tito Mbaweni was our central bank governor, so the three TMs. Um, the plan was to start at 3 to 6% target and slowly bring that down over time. We haven't had a massive amount of opportunity for that, although maybe we could have done it a bit there, but our economy hasn't been growing, so really we, 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 haven't, we haven't really had much space in it there. We, we, we've seen inflation ticking higher. The Reserve Bank modeling is not expecting inflation to go up through the 6% band. In large part, we just have no demand. You know, <laughs> you know if inflation is demand and supply, there's no demand in South Africa. Our, our economy is far too weak. There's simply no demand happening. Um, so inflation is probably going to, 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 to moderate uh, and come back. Interestingly, uh, we're running at an inflation 1.2% lower than the U.S. inflation at the moment. And we've been running lower than the U.S. for the last uh, five months. Textbook will tell you 
that our currency will weaken by the inflation differential unless we lower, in which case our currency should strengthen, but only by that 1.2%. So, I mean, on an annualized basis, not massive. And there are way other significant drivers that uh, currency weakness is, is over the long term, measured over, over decades. And that number absolutely works. Our currency depreciation against the dollars running at about 2 to 2.5%, and that's uh, uh, typically the inflation differential between the two economies. So inflation in South Africa, not scary. Sure, we're currently seeing a weak hazard, which means we import inflation, but what are we importing? I mean, again, the economy is too weak. Um, certainly oil is hurting, petrol price, uh, transport, that does hurt, but we've seen oil come down a bit, although the, the, the weak hazard is gonna hurt that. So I, you know, to me, the key point with inflation is around demand. And we have none in our economy right now. We, ha we do, do, There is just no demand. So I, I don't see our inflation becoming scary at all. And is our inflation structural and baked in? Well, sure. I mean, it's structural and baked in at around about a 5% inflation. Um, and, and that is what, a, you know, what wage increases are kind of happening over the last decade, sometimes four, sometimes six. Uh, but broadly, our inflation is where it, it's been for an age. It's not at those sudden massively elevated le levels. So, given that I'm not worried about SA inflation, given that I am worried about US inflation, what are the winners and losers in that space? So, property, REITs, uh, because they typically have inflation-linked rental increases. Now, they usually do it on a, a triple net le lease, which means that all the utilities, maintenance, and insurance is for the tenant and then the property itself will have an inflation-linked rental increase. So, you know what, any increase in inflation, uh, that's fine. Uh, interest rates will start to hurt, but there's certainly that, that, that yield there. And, and, and the yield is quite the, the, the differential. So inflation running, let's call it 5%, you get a 5% increase. Yeah, your, 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 your uh, 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 rates, were, your, your uh, 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 interest is going up, but not anywhere by the same amount. Commodities, especially energy, love inflation um, and truthfully all commodities now not always the stocks because you've got to watch their costs there's always a risk of of rising costs will, will hurt but th that that everything rally i showed you in commodities earlier in the presentation we, we're going to see that we're going to see it coming through pgms have got their own issues with demand from uh, uh logistic challenges with chip supplies for for vehicle manufacturers but commodities typically really like inflation, uh, and as I say, especially the energy space. Um, financial stocks, bank and insurers, uh, they quite like insurance inflation. They can uh, ramp up costs uh, in terms of, of premiums and the like, a uh, little bit higher interest rates, they get a little more margin there. And generally, emerging markets do, can do fairly well in an inflationary environment because the currency weakens. And that weaker currency, not great for imports, but it's great if you're exporting. And if we get commodities prices, you know, as they are, or perhaps we're going a little more elevated, and we get some weak as are, what we see is you know, suddenly we'll have monies flying into our economy. Now, for us personally, we've got a growth problem. I mean, we, we're just not getting any growth coming through. That's a, a different whole game in its entirety. Ultimately, the, the commodities at a much higher level actually strengthens currency because commodities, you know, we're selling in dollars, converting into czar, and we saw at the midterm budget policy statement of a couple of weeks ago uh, that we've got, what, we were running at 120 odd, 150 odd billion ahead in tax receipts, and that's just because of commodities. But we need those motor vehicle manufacturers to start manufacturing motor vehicles. When is interest products? Uh, because of increasing interest rates, um, inflation-linked uh, uh, retail bonds or the locked-in rate, uh, money in the bank, but not bonds. Yes, the yields and bonds will increase, but understand understand the distinction between primary and secondary market in the bonds. If you go and buy a retail bond, you essentially you're doing it in the primary market. In other words, you buy it from the bond issuer. They pay you the the the, the interest over the period of time, and at the end of it, they give you back your money. Right, and it's just a relationship between you and them. The secondary market is the bonds are issued, and then they start to trade between me and you. And the thing with bonds, yield up, price down. So if we start seeing rates rise because that bond is going to pay 10,000 at the end of the period, or 10 million, or whatever it is at the end of the period, as the yield starts to go up, the value of the bond 
decreases. So not secondary markets. So stay away from those bond ETFs and the like. They're gonna they're gonna come under pressure. But uh, the 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 bond the, the 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 rate on the retail bonds. I think it was nine and a half percent when I last checked for November. Um, that's not bad. And then they've got their inflation linked as well. Food retailers with pricing power. Very important that they have pricing power. Our big food retailers and do. And Shoprite and the others, Pick and Pay, uh, uh, Spar and the others, they've got pricing power on two sides, right? They can uh, squeeze their suppliers and they can push the prices up on the one side. If you notice uh, in the lot in the results and trading updates from Shoprite, from Spar, and from Woolies, their internal inflation. I mean, Shoprite's internal food inflation is about three percent. That's tiny. That's not what food inflation is in the CPI basket. Food in the CPI basket is running, I think it was 12 or 13 percent. Um, but but Shoprite's able to go to you know Tiger Brands and others and say, yeah, we we need a smaller increase from that. Losers, consumer staples. Because we can switch Johnson and Johnson, you buy the nice branded tissues from Johnson and Johnson, uh, but you're getting squeezed because of higher rates. They're pushing prices. Yeah, you go buy the non-branded. Uh, transport because of energy price increases. Food producers, food producers get squeezed all over the place. They get squeezed by increase in transport costs. They get squeezed by just their raw material prices, uh, you know, ammonium nitrate, et cetera. We've seen it in the cost of fertilizer going up markedly. They win because they can get higher prices for their commodities. Um, so the farmers kind of get kind of squeezed and on the one side, they win because of the higher commodity price. The food producer, however, particularly if you look at maize, soya, uh, 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 wheat, sunflower, which are all at massively elevated, and sunflower is at record levels, 10,500 uh, a ton. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, maize, yellow and white, still around three, three, three and a half thousand a ton. You know, huge levels in those prices. Um, and the, the, the producers have to pay those prices. So they get squeezed on the input. Then they go to ShopRite, and ShopRite's like, uh, yeah, no, not taking that. So food producers, Tiger Brands, stay the heck away. Um, high cost base. High cost base hurts your leverage because what I mean by high cost base is where you've got a, a base and then you sort of make the margin on the top. But if you've got a very, very high cost base and you're seeing inflation in that, can you pass it on? Can you squeeze? It's those companies, particularly that are in very competitive spaces, who are going to struggle to pass on the increased costs. Those are the ones who are really, really going to suffer as well. Food producers, uh, staples, but also valuations. So high flying stocks. How does a asset manager, fund manager, investor, they value their stocks, they use things like discounted cash flow, DCF and the like, and an input into that is the interest rate. And if interest rates are higher, that, that, that reduces today's valuation of that stock. It makes the stock less valuable today. So we certainly have some of those very, very high valuation stocks, which I think are going to perhaps be under some level of, 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 of risk in terms of their, their massive valuations. Um, and, and, you know, so, I mean, Tesla is undoubtedly one of them. But, but you know, have a look across some of those, those forward PEs. Some of the stocks, I mean, Microsoft, Apple, they've been doing great guns. Amazon, they've been having a spectacular period over, over the last two years uh, and absolutely printing money. But the higher interest rate does affect valuations. Will it see equity markets down? Maybe, maybe not. But if interest rates start to get to chunkier levels, you know, 1% is not exciting. But if we start seeing US rates at 3 4 what about 5%? And, and we've been there in the last uh, 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 decade or so. Then suddenly at that point, you know, your, your, your long-term yield on the S&P is eight. You return on the S&P. Total return on the S&P is eight or nine. Been way better than this decade. The previous decade, it was zero. Literally, the S&P did nothing for the first decade in the century and then caught up this one. But suddenly you can go and get into a very hot market with high valuations uh, and maybe get a, a good return, but when the average return is only expected to be about eight or so, or you go hoid in the bank and you earn 5%, a lot of people are going to go put it in the bank. You might say, no, never, but trust me, there are a lot of folks who will. So in closing, transitory, no. Nah. 
Transitory is off the table. It's not transitory. Is it baked in? Is it becoming part of the system in the US? Yes, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. To me, the trigger for me was when the cost of living increase for social security came in at 5.9%. You know, highest in decades. It's starting to get baked in. Is it hyperinflation? No, not even close. We don't have what we saw around the, you know, take an example, oil up 10x, we need oil at $400, no, $500. That's just not happening, not even close to happening. Um, we haven't had, you know, medium household income in, in the US has been flat since the 80s. American families are not richer. Last year helped with the unemployment uh, uh, and, and COVID checks that were that were sent to families, you know, helicopter money. But that is that was transitory, and that is now completely out of the system. So is it hyperinflation? No. But are we heading for a period of higher inflation in the U.S. and certainly a period above the two percent target? Yes, I think absolutely we are. I think by the end of next year, I'm expecting U.S. inflation to be around three or four percent. I think we'll see at least three rate increases during next year, but that only takes it to one percent. That's not enough to bring inflation down. If the Fed really wants to get aggressive, they've got to go harder. I don't think they will do it next year. They've got a, a almost a dual mandate, full employment and inflation below two percent. They're not at full employment. Uh, they've still got a bit of ways to go on that. Maybe they're there by the end of next year or into 2023, in which case, you know, I think three increases of 25 points next year takes the Fed rate to 1%. I think we get another four in 2023 at 2%. None of this is stopping inflation. I think we've got an environment of three to 4% inflation, and maybe at some point it's two to 3% inflation in the US for the next couple of years. Initially, i.e. next year, that's gonna be a painful process as the market adjusts. We've had cheap money for, for, for you know, a decade plus. The market needs to adjust to this. But as the market adjusts to it, there's there's bunches who can do perfectly uh, uh, well from it. Um, your commodities, your, your financial stocks don't mind some inflation. Your REITs, your US REITs, et cetera, uh, emerging markets can benefit of that at the same time. So last slide is a bunch of you would have been saying, what about gold and Bitcoin? So the correlation between gold and inflation is exactly zero. And I mean that, that is the correlation. Um, if we go back to when the US came off the gold standard, which was 40 years ago this year. Uh, the correlation is zero, which means it's a 50-50. It's a coin toss as to whether or not gold will benefit from inflation. For me, more than anything, what will help gold is the belief, again, okay, expectation. The belief that gold will benefit from inflation will therefore perhaps drive the gold price higher. Go and uh, uh, look at the gold tra chart. And it was 1860, and now sudden, suddenly it's down at 1780 again. But watch the chart, wait for the breakout, either by the gold itself or by a gold miner, but trade it on the technicals, don't trade it on the fear. Is Bitcoin an inflation hedge? No ways, not even close. Truthfully, Bitcoin creates inflation. You know, we've got an asset, that has gone up, what's Bitcoin up this year? 3X, 4X in a year, uh, that's inflationary. I mean, you know, people are out there spending it, but we'll park that for another day as well. I'll come to that at some other time. Um, but are, are these inflation hedges? No, they're not. If you want a proper inflation hedge, go get yourself an inflation linked uh, 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 bond, uh, buy it in the primary market, in other words, an SA retail government bond. Um, and then you've, so what they do, is they increase the capital every year by every six months by the inflation rate, and then they pay three or three and a half percent uh, interest on the now increased capital, so that at the end of the period, and they do up to a 10-year period, at the end of the of the period when the bond uh, matures and you get your money back, it has grown by inflation, and the income that you've kicked off it has also gone by inflation. Uh, contact details, uh, disclaimers, and questions. First question, am I doing a massive repositioning of my portfolio? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I'm always tweaking portfolios. I'm, I'm buying some bits. I, I, I've been selling some Willys. I've been buying some Marion Roberts. Um, I'm having a hard look at the reopening stocks. Uh, the City Lodge update today was quite interesting. They say they're doing around 40% occupancies uh, since, since beginning of November, which is what, only three weeks or so. They're at break even at about 35. Now, the next set of results is not going to reflect that because it's going to include periods of 
of of of uh, uh, you know way lower occupancies. But I, I can see something there. I'm worried about the the you know lockdowns over Christmas, etc. If that lockdown, if we if our fourth wave and resulting lockdowns and restrictions sort of comes in January and we get a really, really strong Christmas, it's going to be really, really good for them. Um, but I'm having a strong, hard look at some of the reopenings. Am I preferred in the space? <sighs> All of them. I mean, I, look, I'm looking at Soho Hotels. I'm looking at Soho Gaming. I'm looking at Sun International. I'm looking at City Lodge. Um, they've all run, they ran hard, but they're now all pulling back. Uh, if we get another family meeting and some lockdowns, which I, yeah, it's probably, I, I'm kind of expecting it to happen in the next couple of weeks. I mean, I hope not, but probably it will. I think they're going to take a bit of a pounding there as well. And your other lockdowns is your famous brands, your 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 Spurs and the like as well. Um, but again, we get curfews at nine o'clock. Their sit-down dining just absolutely collapses and disappears off the radar. Would I be buying oil at these levels? Uh, I wouldn't. Um, at around $80, I wouldn't be buying oil. There is uh, an ETN locally, SBOIL, which tracks uh, Brent um, in rands. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch listed globally. I, I, if anything, I'd be looking for, for shorts on, on oil. Uh, we had the fill-up earlier in the week because of a release from reserves. Um, the, the global economy is picking up, but I think it's going to be a, a, a hard winter um, in terms of, of, of oil usage, although we're seeing prices, uh, energy prices rocketing in Europe, um, just, you know, we, we're seeing level in front doing 30,000 cases um, and their responses, they're going to give booster jabs. Nice, but I'm not sure that directly solves the problem. I think people are going to start locking themselves down potentially. So uh, oil, I think oil is probably, probably worth 60, not 80. So I would be looking for a short on oil. Uh, preferred retailer, top right, 500 miles, top right, easy. Um, banks, yeah, so with banks, I cheat. I, I own the Satrix Finney, which gives me exposure to banks. That's nice, it's easy, it's clean. Uh, it, it does what it says on the sticker. I hold Capitec as well. Generally, the preference for banks is first round. The contrarians would tell you Nedbank because it's been a lagger uh, with Absa and Standard Bank in the middle. Uh, some folks prefer Standard Bank over first round. I, I, I struggle to differentiate between the, the, the big banks aside from Capitec. So I hold Capitec and then I hold the Satrix Finney, which I've got in my tax-free account. Ladies and gents, not seeing any more questions come through, so we will park it there. Uh, appreciate your time today. Uh, thanks to market.com for uh, bringing this event to us this evening. Uh, everyone, stay safe, look after yourself. If you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.